welcome to slide reviews. So today we're going to talk about a lot of different dermatoses in the derm path realm. As always, if you can click on the first slide, you know, it's going to zoom in, that's okay. Uh, so we start off with our disclaimer. Yeah, don't touch any of that stuff. <laughs> People will not be happy if the WebEx stops. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions about the disclaimer, feel free to contact me in the con comments or on Twitter. So we are roughly breaking things up into spongiotic psoriasis form and vesiculobullous dermatoses. <coughs> so let's get started. Case one. Erythema, it's like a maybe? I don't know if my term phrase is macula, macula. Yeah, it's so a little more macular raised, more patched. Raised. Yeah. Because you kind of have, like, here's more of mm -hmm. your slightly raised macula, and here's it's a little more of a patch. They all have size determinants. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, and here's your slide. Skin biopsy. Skin biopsy, yes. Make sure voice so we can hear you. All right, so what we have here, zoom in real quick. Mm -hmm. This looks kind of spongiotic, I would yeah. say. This is spongiosis. Um, some lymphocytes gathering around here. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see now, do I see anything else? Maybe a few eels. Hiding along there. Yeah, there's. Yeah, there's a few of them. them. Yeah, can you start seeing them? I think these are eels. Yeah, these are eels. I think are just projecting kind of fun. Yeah, nervous. those are eels. Okay. They're really red. They have the the headphones or yeah. disco ball nuclei. That's not. That's a bristle. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. Uh, maybe a bit of acanthosis. It's mildly here. Mm -hmm. um, all right. It's some sort of dermatitis. Well, that that's great since that's the topic <laughs> that we're dealing with this week. Uh, did the clinical picture maybe give you some hints as to well, what this is? It's very localized. It look like. Mm -hmm. And on the arms, so I would say it probably is caused by an irritant. So, okay. irritant contact dermatitis. Okay. Yeah. Are there other types of contact dermatitis? Well, yes. Yes, okay. Allergic contact. Allergic contact con dermatitis. dermatitis. Yeah. Okay, so this is allergic contact dermatitis, okay. and the hint was you had the watch. The watch probably has nickel in it, so that's an allergic contact dermatitis. Although, how was he wearing his watch to get, like, the thing below? Because he had the watch bit. That's... So that's a good question, but the, the nickel likely is in the clasp, and if you're doing different things, like maybe it's sliding up and pressing against the skin more. Um, no, I'm just being facetious. <laughs> <laughs> but that's probably what's actually happening there. Um, okay, so this is also known as eczematous dermatitis, relatively like not uncommon, up to 5% of the population uh, deals with ACD. And it's inflammation on the skin related to contact with an allergen. So uh, this is actually a type four cell mediated delayed hypersensitivity reaction. For those of you who love immuno, we are not going into the immuno of that. That's as, as far as I'm reaching today. Um, so very common things that we think about with this would be things like poison ivy, poison oak. Um, and this is actually the most common thing um, when we have people out in the woods and they are aware that they are in contact with these uh, leaves that have the oil that, that induces the, the type four cell mediated delayed hypersensitivity reaction, um, you can see how this would be very prevalent, whether it's adults or children, and it's actually more common than all the other allergens combined. So. Uh, Maybe we all should have joined, I don't know, like the Scouts or, or Brownies or whatever when we were kids so that we would have learned to avoid these things. 
Um, other things that you can think of, nickel, so that would be our watch. Uh, some people have these kind of reactions to fragrance, fragrances or cosmetics. Um, this is what happens when someone says that they have a latex allergy. Uh, formaldehyde, so that's pertinent for all of us working in pathology, right? Because we're around uh, formalin all the time. Um, the reaction tends to occur within one to two days after exposure and can last up to a month. Um, so this often involves very intense itching or pruritus, it can be painful, and patients can also experience a fever because of the uh, very prolific immune response. And it's skin and exposure, so any skin can be involved, but it's generally very localized to either one region or it's generalized in a random pattern. Um, there are some differences, what it looks like grossly between subacute, acute, and chronic. Um, obviously, as we start off, you're going to have some mild erythema and small papules. Then as you go further, those are going to become more well-defined, uh, more erythematous. You're going to start to develop vesicles or blisters and bulla. Um, you can even get erosions in, in some cases. And over time, what's going to happen is you're going to get thickening of these plaques or lichenification. You may or may not have scaling. And because it's pruritic, you're also going to have issues related to excoriation because patients are going to scratch that. Um, so you do want to think about um, infections that can come with those excoriations as well as uh, potential scarring related to that. Okay, so the other contact dermatitis that was brought up was ICD or irritant contact dermatitis. So histologically, basically these look the same. Um, your spongiosis, which is the, your top left picture, so really what spongiosis is showing is uh, the definite separation between each individual epithelial cell. Um, sometimes you can even see um, the projections between, uh, between the, the squamous epithelium um, because they are hanging on to each other for dear life. Uh, you can see neutrophils as well as some um, lymphocytes, histiocytes, those eosinophils could make an appearance as well, but you should really not see necrosis in the acute phase. Chronically, um, patients will develop perikeratosis. Your spongiosis is not going to be as prominent, and they can also develop um, epidermal hyperplasia, um, which again gets you into this um, sort of spectrum where you have the, the contact dermatitis um, becoming lichenified and how is that so much different from lichen simplex chronicus. So these are all things to think about. You may or may not see eosinophils in your dermis. Uh, the case that I showed you did have some scattered eosinophils in the dermis so you want to pay attention to that. And you may or may not have epidermal necrosis um, or the uh, little micro abscesses. So in the top right picture, uh, you have a white curved arrow that's pointing towards one of those micro abscesses. I uh, do have a picture of ICD in there. I'm not trying to fool you. It's just that's how more of the chronic picture would look where you can see that, that very prominent perikeratosis thickening. Um, so these things look very similar. It's the history that's going to help you with that. Okay, for most of these things, there's, there's really no stains that are going to help you. There's no molecular that's really going to help you with this. So your differential, uh, so you want to think about other uh, things that can cause spongiotic uh, dermatitis. So there's a whole bunch of them there. Uh, you want to think about infectious things like mycosis fungoides. Is it a dermatophytosis? Or is this just a chronic allergic contact dermatitis? Also got to think about your ICD in there. Um, we kind of went over that already. So treatment, well, avoid poison oak, poison ivy. Um, if you're in pathology, you can only avoid formaldehyde so much, but don't be splashing it on your skin. That's not a good thing to do anyway. Uh, they can give corticosteroids for um, mild cases where it's not really going away and it's really bothersome to the patient and oral steroids in severe cases. Um, so up top, what you can see is this is very likely an adhesion uh, 
allergy that that the patient's reacting to because you can make out the outline of very likely uh, a pad over top of that sutured area. Um, so you can see how well demarcated that is. And the bottom one pretty much is just showing you there's a couple of eosinophils hanging hanging out to say hello, as well as some more of those microabscesses in the inset. Allergic contact dermatitis. Case two. thickened the skin, kind of bumpy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's on the leg, so the pendant portion of the body. Very thick. More of the same type of tissue, more or less, kind of a little less, more fragmented this time around. So looking at the superficially, this part I'm assuming is keratin, this, you know, it looks very thickened. Very well could be. Mm -hmm. We'll find out once we zoom in, but you know, we're going to always start far away and we move closer. Yes! I'm finally getting through to you guys. Start I'm always doing power. far away. It's just like it doesn't project <laughs> well and it makes you want to squint, so you have to go in and take a look. But anyways, <laughs> um, the rest of this tissue looks very blue, so it's, you know, very cellular, bluish nuclei, you know. Um, yes. So probably some inflammation going on there. So with that being said, no real pattern, just diffusely blue and diffusely something thickened is here that's acellular looking because it's mostly pink. Remember, pink is death, blue is life. <laughs> okay. I like, that. I like that. Pink is death, or purple is life. I don't know. Purple. Let's say purple. <laughs> I know you like purple. <laughs> I do like purple. Yeah, okay. anyone who knows me, I'm a purple fanatic, so All right, that is so true. we're going to zoom in. Let's check out this section first. So it's still acellular? <laughs> okay. See what I'm saying? It's, it doesn't project well, but it, it looks more, it is very cellular. It's just very blue. A lot of, I guess, lymphocytes stuck in here. Probably oh. maybe some. No, what else do you got? Maybe if you that's either an eel or a plasma cell. Okay. Um maybe it looks like plasma cytoid. Because it's off on one side. I think these are plasma cells. Maybe here, 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 here. It's just a mass of ugly looking red and stuff. Okay. Hmm. Maybe over here would be a bit better. Yeah, that's, I don't know. I honestly think those are plasma cells. They're kind of redder than. So, what else is kind of red? Like eels. Eels? I think I you got some neutrophils, actually yeah. a lot of neutrophils yeah. in there. Uh, there's a lot of blood, and that's not helping you yeah. either. And fibrin. Yeah. And ooh, a lot of um, vascular proliferation here. Yeah. That's unusual. Okay. Ah, here's the skin area. Not yeah. really, not really catching the keratin, like keratin here, mostly just. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's fragmented and it's yeah. not the best orientation. Yeah. Okay. So that's why you know you can't always look at this far away. You know, it just projects <laughs> funny. <laughs> let's give. It, let's chalk it up to that. But yeah, there is. Yeah. So I mean, I guess the key feature here is just there's a lot of inflammation, a lot of chronic inflammation, and mm -hmm. these proliferation of these. Um, uh, there's like sort of looks like some sort of stasis, anyways, like with all the fiber, but. There is definitely proliferation of like some blood vessels here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. There is another feature that's kind of prominent in this case. Mm. Has to do with your vessels. To give you a bit of a hint. And this is not the best area to look for it. This is probably one of the better areas. What's going on in like this area? Fibrosis. Oh, extra vas, extra vasation. Yeah, extra vasation of what kind of cell? Red cells. Red cells. Yep. Yeah. I mean, what other cells can be extra vasated? <laughs> well, you know. I mean, if you want to go into the white blood cells and neutrophils, yeah, but. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just being cheeky today. 
That's okay. <laughs> Hopefully somebody will find this hilarious besides us. <laughs> if not, they are missing out. Um, but yeah, okay, so we have proliferation of a lot of vessels. Yes. Um, what you actually have in, in the area that you were first looking at, it's probably a lot of like serum crusting, mm -hmm. um, maybe even like some, an area that's ulcerated or abscessed. Um, but it's so fragmented that makes it kind of difficult to evaluate, but that's probably what's going on there. Like I feel like the gross image on this case probably tells us more about what we're dealing with. It very likely does, yeah. and uh, I mean, and, and the history would lead into that as yeah. well. Okay, so what do we got? Stasis dermatitis. Stasis dermatitis. I love it. All right, so this mostly occurs in our older adults, middle-aged to elderly, males equal to females, and it develops secondary to long-standing venous insufficiency. So we think about our patients with heart problems, we think about our diabetic patients, where you probably see this most commonly. Um, and what it relates to is you have all this pressure in your capillaries. So at first they, they become very congested and they dilate up until the point where it's almost like a, a balloon effect where you know you start getting these red blood cells just popping out and that's your extravasation. There's just too much pressure in there and they can't handle it and that causes a lot of irritation at the site and then you get all the downstream effects. Um, so because it's dependent, obviously it's going to occur most commonly in our distal extremities. Um, but if it does occur in the upper extremities, then that's usually related to AV fistula, so your uh, dialysis patients. Uh, and it can also occur secondary to bug chiari, so bug chiari having to do with hypertension involving your liver. Okay. So, as we saw, these are brown to black discolorations of the affected skin, or sometimes they can even look erythematous, scaly, um, and even be uh, plaque-like. So then you would think about, okay, is this really like an, an eczema, is this psoriasis? Um, so a lot of things to consider with, with these lesions. Um, one thing that can help you though is if they have very prominent varicose veins in the area, that could help you uh, determine that there's already some form of congestion. Okay, so what we didn't really appreciate in our case, but you you should see is acanthosis or thickening of the epidermal layer with mild spongiosis. So you shouldn't have that very prominent spongiosis that we saw with our contact dermatitis. You uh, will have overlying hyperkeratosis, and you can either have orthokeratosis or parakeratosis, depending on the case. And there's a proliferation of superficial dermal blood vessels. So uh, it, again, this is this is a very reactive change, so there's going to be a, a lot of additional capillaries and um, venules. Um, you may or may not see fibrosis, so again, fibrosis is always a very chronic process. So even if this is starting to occur and you don't quite have that uh, very noticeable brown discoloration in the skin, you may or may not also see fibrosis with this. And there's that. RBC extravasation that we already alluded to, you may or may not have hemosiderin deposition. So if you're wondering, hey, is this hemosiderin or is it melanin, a Prussian blue or iron stain can really help you figure that out. And if you're worried that oh, is this is a Kaposi sarcoma because we have this proliferation of all these vessels, if you did an HHV8, it would be negative. So your differential, well, Kaposi's is in there, hemangioma, angiosarcoma, is it eczema? Uh, is it atrophy blanche? Is it acroangiodermatitis? So a lot of things that look very similar. So there's a lot of different things that they can do for this. More often than not, they're going to try to use conservative methods, which is things like using compression stockings, elevating the affected limb, exercising to help improve uh, circulation as well as lose weight for patients who, who have that as an added uh, risk, as well as emollients to keep the skin from, from drying out too much. Okay. Ooh. Okay. It's a perioral sort of rash type lesion. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't look elevated. Power 
they're not really too exciting, except there seems to be this band of blue stuff mm -hmm. underneath the epidermis there, which is strange. But let's take a look. Okay, uh, epidermis looks okay, I think. There does seem to be, ooh, are these blood vessels? These might be blood vessels. There is a lot of inflammation, a lot of chronic inflammation, mm -hmm. and uh, it's pretty superficial. And it seems to be surrounding the vessels. Yeah. And I don't really see any other cells at this magnification. It looks like mostly lymphocytic. Uh, there's a few of them. Like if you go up here. Oh yeah, a few eos. Hey, a few eos in derm path can mean a lot. Ah, uh, derm path. <laughs> we love derm path. We love derm path. But we don't love eels. <laughs> we don't love eels. <laughs> no, yes. I'm just kidding. We love eels too. The, the <laughs> differential with the eos and derm path can be frightening sometimes. Okay. So mostly lymphocytes, a few eels. Yes. All right. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anything in your epidermis? Well, it's, I don't know, would you consider it acanthotic at all? It doesn't look too yeah. thick and it's not too bad. I don't think it's really that yeah. impressive. Yeah. Um, Someone's going to watch this video and be like, oh my god, that, that was so acanthotic. Didn't you guys see that? Um. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not convinced. Maybe a bit here. Maybe, but mm, oh, let's check for the other piece. As good pathologist, you should always look at, oh, this one, I could, oh, I could see maybe it's a little acanthotic. Okay. Maybe, but it's also a little tangential, too, so. Point in favor and point against. Okay. But this one's not as, like, inflam inflamed. Inflamed, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, uh, there is a little bit of spongiosis, but. There's always spongiosis. There isn't always spongiosis. <laughs> Is always you spongiosis. are cheeky today. <laughs> <laughs> There's mild spongiosis, uh, and I think. And spongiosis is just like, sort of like this edematous looking bit, right? See, there's spongiosis. Okay. You can good. make out the the processes in between. Mm -hmm. Like, look at that. That's beautiful. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. Look at them. They're clasping hands. Okay. They're they're totally not social distancing. But that's okay. <laughs> We're allowed to, to be, you know, <laughs> together because we have many disorders where that's a problem when they're not together, right? Mm -hmm. But okay, so this is eczema. This specifically is numular eczema, um, also known as discoid eczema, papular fascicular, orbicular eczema. Um, so I know I was somewhat leading you, misleading you um, by giving you a periorbital or sorry, a perioral uh, picture in a child, um, but eczema tends to look very similar in multiple areas, and uh, there also was not a clinical picture of numular eczema in uh, PATH presenters, so there is that too. So you know, if Dr. Gardner or Dr. Singh or anyone else in Derm PATH is listening, we would really like more clinical pictures. Okay. Um, so this occurs most commonly in older adults, as uh, so by mole peak, so six to seventh decade, so 60, 70 years old, and 20 to 30 years old. It's very rare in children, and these lesions are often very itchy. So like eczema and a lot of other areas, uh, your risk factors are include things like, are they stressed? Is their skin dry? Is there stasis? So thinking back to our stasis dermatitis, that's why emollients are so uh, important with that, and also if they had atopic dermatitis in childhood. So your past can come back to haunt you in derm path. Um, so sites, this, this tends to occur on the dorsal or sensor surfaces of your extremities and back. Um, they're well demarcated, circular, coin-like as the name suggests, erythematous patches or plaques. They can be solitary or, or multiple, and they range in size from quarter to palm size. On microscopy, they have a very spongiotic pattern with microvesicle formation in the acute form uh, to minimal 
and the chronic lesions. I didn't really appreciate too much microvesicle formation in our case, so maybe it's more of a chronic lesion. There will be superficial perivascular inflammation, as we noted. It's predominantly going to be lymphocytes, but you can also see histiocytes and you will see eosinophils. I know in our case we only saw a few of them, but it's still enough, especially if you have the correct history. Uh, you will also see epidermal acanthosis or thickening, um, but that occurs again more with the chronic lesions. So if you have something that's very acute, you likely will not appreciate that. Differential? Oh well, look, we have pretty much every other eczematous process or spongiosis on the list. Um, and a lot of these things very likely are in this lecture, right? Not to give too much away. And you also need to think about drug eruption. So uh, drug reactions can cause a lot of different things in many organs. The skin is no different. So it's something that you need to think about uh, whenever you have something that, that has like um, the, that eosinophilic. Uh, inflammation as well. Treatment, so again, we have emollients, and those are first line, so keeping that skin nice and moist is one of the ways um, to prevent a lot of these eruptions. They can do steroids, they can do methotrexate, you can do antihistamines, so again, these are very pruritic lesions, so you want to uh, prevent the patients from having additional damage due to excoriation, and because they are related to dry skin and stress and all these other things, they have relapses Commonly. Eczema. So now we're moving on. Okay. To case Looks like four. someone's finger, between someone's fingers. Mm -hmm. There does seem to be a discolored, almost thickened area of skin. It's darkened and it's just thickened. Yes. Excellent. More skin. More skin. It's different. It is. It's very different. So we have this nice bit of like keratosis. I'm going to need your help here because I can never get orthokeratosis right. So versus para because parakeratosis we see, but ortho I do not know. So orthokeratosis, ortho meaning straight or regular. So that would be normal. Okay. Okay. So this is. <laughs> and someone may correct me on that too. <laughs> Leading to this is part I of do ortho. have a very nice spreadsheet from Dr. Singh, though, that I can provide to okay. you guys as well. All right, so <laughs> it's you know hyperkeratotic, and para, you could you know tell me is this ortho or para? I would say it doesn't look like para, so ortho. Um. So well, this looks more ortho. Okay. Let's right let's go here. with ortho. That's hyperkeratotic. Yes, it's hyperkeratotic. You know what? For since we're not derm path, we will just say it's hyperkeratotic, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, someone can elucidate further and it's, educate us. It's also acanthotic. I, this one I can say definitely it looks acanthotic. That's way too. Yes, hard. and what I really love is if you go to the edges of the lesion, you can actually see where it becomes oh, yeah. normal. Then yeah. So look at that. Yeah. Beautiful, isn't it? It's showing you in in then, its then, own then, biopsy. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then there is, yeah, I wouldn't say I've seen that much spongiosis here. That's good. Yeah. These but lesions don't typically have spongiosis. Ah, something different. <laughs> good. Yeah. Um, okay, and then there seems to be a hypergranulosis granular there. Mm -hmm. It seems to be kind of accentuated right beneath there. Um, there does seem to be some like inflammation and also seems to be like kind of like perivascular like the previous one in case we looked at. It seems to be focused around these blood vessels. Yeah. Concentrated. It's, it's really mild. Yeah. Uh, I mean like it gets to the point where you're looking at this case going, does that qualify? Everything else fits, so yeah. um, your inflammation just really isn't that yeah. impressive. Um, You know, what are these cells? Are they just vessels and whatnot caught in the weird? So there are some vessels, and there is some inflammation around mm -hmm. them as well. Okay. Um, but it's nowhere near the the extreme inflammation that we've seen in other cases yeah. so far. I mean, I'm not seeing much anything else. Maybe there's with this. Oh, is this something? Kind of hard to tell. 
Basement membrane? Yeah, well, basement membrane, just like... Uh, no, it's nothing. Never mind. Alright, that's all I got. Okay, well, be a good pathologist and go look at the other piece. Yes. Similar. Uh, it's probably like a gland or something. It's got mm -hmm. a weird angle. Yeah, okay, it looks about the same. Okay. Is that all? Am I missing something? No, that, that's it. Okay, yay. <laughs> so, what do we have? Um, well, the hyperkeratosis got stuck on mm -hmm. like a lichen. Is it lichen? So, uh, oh God! What is, is what's the full term of this? It's lichen something something chronicus. Uh, lichen sim, 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 lichen right. simplex chronicus. Yeah, the Latin yeah. term. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is lichen simplex chronicus. Okay, so again we have our adults, 30, 50 years old, and what do we notice? Different from lichen sclerosis. Yes, different from lichen sclerosis. <laughs> Excellent question. Um, so, unless we're talking about breast or GYN, we always try to notice when there's a sex discrepancy. So in this, we see this more often in females than males. And these are changes secondary to chronic itching and scratching. So think about all those lesions that we had that were very pruritic. Um, so obviously this is something that over time you could see with them. Uh, so I guess that goes into my next point. Multiple causes uh, related to pruritus, I should say related to, um, and it's a huge long list, so just anything that can make you itchy, you could get this if you continue itching for a very long period of time. Uh, specifically looking at derm, uh, these would be things like atopic dermatitis or allergic contact dermatitis, insect or arthropod bites, as well as stasis dermatitis, okay? All these things that make you very itchy. Um, one of the other things that you can think of would be um, like dyshydrotic uh, eczema, also very itchy, which I know we did not go over, but uh, that is another thing that is very itchy. Um, so as everything else, this can occur anywhere that there's skin, but it tends to occur most commonly in the posterior lateral neck. So, you know, back of your neck gets really itchy, um, on the forearms and the thighs. Uh, lower legs, ankles, you see this very commonly in GYN and GU, so the vulva, the scrotum, as well as perianal areas. These tend to be very well circumscribed erythematous, thickened scaly plaques or papules with lichenification as the name suggests, as well as excoriations because they are super itchy and they are often hyperpigmented, which again is a more reactive process. Okay, microscopy. Hyperorthokeratosis, hypergranulosis. So we have our closed straight arrow pointing at your hyperorthokeratosis. Your hypergranulosis is highlighted by the open arrowhead, and uh, then you can see that, like the, the curved arrow, I don't know, maybe the intact basal layer, it's not super obvious why it's there. Um, and there's often papillary dermal fibrosis. So your superficial dermis will have fibrosis, um, again, related to con continued excoriations. Uh, perivascular inflammation is often mixed, and you can see perikeratosis, but that's rare. So if you have a lot of perikeratosis, you might want to think about something else besides L LSE. So your differential, oh look, a lot of things we've already talked about, right? Is it psoriasis? Is it chronic spongiotic dermatitis, is it uh, seborrheic dermatitis? I can't speak yet today. Uh, chronic superficial cutaneous fungal infections can cause this. Uh, Keratoacanthomas and squamous cell carcinomas can also be very similar, um, but obviously, grossly, they're gonna look very different. So that, again, that's where having a good relationship with the clinician and knowing what's going on with the patient will help you out a lot. 
So unlike what we've seen previously, these are going to be treated, okay? So whereas we saw a lot of very conservative management with other lesions, these are either going to be treated with topical or intralesional, not even oral, but intralesional steroids. And you can also give the patient oral antihistamines. Most of these are going to have a benign course, but obviously uh, when we have things like squamous cell carcinoma and the differential, you need to think about, okay, is there a reason that that would be in there? And yes, if you have chronic irritation over time, chronic wounds that aren't allowed to heal, that is a very real concern. Lichen simplex chronicus, very common. So something that you should definitely be sure to know, um, even if you aren't planning on uh, subspecializing in derm path, because you see it in a lot of other uh, areas. Case five. Ooh, okay, kind of like a central scaly um, sort of flat patch. Yep. Uh, sa uh, pink salmon. I don't know. Wow, you're gonna, you're going like straight for the uh, Pantone colors, like. <laughs> <laughs> well, until I start going to tope and tofu and stuff like that, you know. Then you're just going to make us all hungry. Well, okay. we're pathologists. We always think. <laughs> <laughs> Except for this. this well, mm, I guess salmon. Yeah, salmon. Okay. <laughs> it's pink. It's very pink. And it has like this sort of white. They uh, may call it silvery. But, you know, this white scaling on the edges where it just kind of looks dry and flaky. Mm -hmm. And here's your skin because this is derm pass. So you're going to get skin every time. Um, so from far away we have, you know, two pieces, um, not really that much acanthosis, the epidermal layer looks kind of thin, mm -hmm. uh, the fact that it changed once we zoom in, the keratin la layer seems to be alright, um, yeah. so far, so let's zoom in, let's see what we got, okay, there's definitely spongiosis, right? Yes. Is that a processing artifact? Um, yeah, well, I mean, there's a bit of maybe hyperkeratosis here. Um, is, okay, is that hyperkeratosis? I don't know. What's in it? Oh, para hyper. No. Yeah, so you see the, the nuclei? So, yeah, that's parakeratosis. Okay, does ortho keratosis have. No, they don't. They don't have nuclei in it. Correct. Okay. Correct. And Whereas para, para does. Does. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> okay. So yeah, parakeratosis focally. Okay. Um, there's dust. Hey, you're not done with the epidermis. What? What I'm else? Just looking around. What's not there? I'm gonna say. The granular layer, final answer. Yeah, there's no granular layer, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that basophilic stippling that you see in the epidermis, that's that's absent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Shh. <laughs> 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 All right. So it's not there. Um, yeah. So like the paracolor characters is kind of just like here and there, not everywhere, not diffuse. Um, some, you know, yeah. inflammation in the superficial dermis around perivascular, pretty much like what we've seen so far. Okay, what kind um, of inflammation? Kind. Lymphocytic? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do I are, see you, are you asking or telling me? Well, I'm not. I'm just saying because, you know, eosinophils like to hide in there and, like, I just want to make sure there's none creeping around. Oh, there's some, maybe some extra vaccination here. Yeah. Ooh, look at that. But, yes, this is lymphocytic. Yeah. See, yeah. they kind of look like eels, but they're not. I think these they're, are red cells. Yeah, they're, they're red blood yeah. cells. Okay. And, I don't know, is there anything else that... Okay. Oh, the other piece. The other Sorry, piece, I yes. Just, I'm full screen <laughs> this. Got excited there. 
Uh, yeah, you know, pretty much the same as the other one. Okay. This, oh, there's some parakeratosis right there. Okay, ha, ha, ha. so the way the parakeratosis is, it in these cases is very characteristic. Does it? Is is the parakeratosis like match with the silvery scales we're seeing on the gross image? That's a good question. It probably does, mm -hmm. but I don't actually know. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So what do we got, E? I don't know. Sideriasis. Sideriasis. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> um, see, yeah. Okay. I mean, that picture, I mean, the other thing you could think of is probably, like, regular psoriasis, but I think those, the scaly, like, whatever, lesions are more prominent than, mm. I don't know. I okay. don't see enough skin to know that for sure. So, probably if I tell you the clinical information, you're going to know what this is right away. Okay, please do. So, the distribution of the scales, which you cannot appreciate in the picture, mm -hmm. tend to form what is called the Christmas tree pattern. Christmas tree. That's a step. Yeah, that, that's a step, step that's like, step one, step you know, two, pediatric uh, shelf exam. Yes. It's like head of that. Yeah. yeah. So. So what is that? What forms our, our Christmas tree? It's the sideriasis, isn't it? Yeah. No, it's Petraeus and Rodesio. Yeah. A word that I probably am going to butcher, but yeah, Petraeus rosacea. I had it, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> it's very common, so yeah, it's very common. there you go. And it goes away. It's yeah, away. it does, it does. Uh, so, you know, we have anywhere from our adolescents to younger adults. Females run males, slight predominance, so keep that in mind. And it's self-limited, so usually it's going to be gone within about two months. Uh, typically before they start seeing the Girl patches and the tree patterns. Okay. Trigger words. Yeah, trigger words. Um, so they're going to have flu-like symptoms a couple weeks before these things start appearing. Um, my next point is Harold patch. Okay, here I thought of. <laughs> but the Harold patch just means that you're, they usually have a single lesion that that comes before everything else, and then they start getting the, this crop of everything else. It can be mildly to moderately paritic, um, but it's often asymptomatic. And because you have this Christmas tree pattern, it, it often occurs on the trunk, so in whether uh, front or back of the trunk, as well as the neck, the extremities, um, but the face is normally spared, okay? So that's, that's another thing you have to consider with uh, rashes is what's spared. Um, this also typically doesn't uh, involve distal extremities, palms and soles. So again, those are all hints as to what you're looking at. And yes, you have this Papulosquamous eruption of salmon pink ovoid lesions. Um, <laughs> so your hair patch usually has a central fine scale with per a peripheral trailing collarette. And last week we looked at collarettes, so everybody is an expert on those now and how we visualize that. Um, and then when they have the generalized eruption, so remember the hair patch comes first and then the generalized eruption, you're going to have all these uh, one to one, one centimeter to one inch salmon pink round ovoid papules. Uh, they'll have this fur or Christmas tree pattern, and they do that because they follow the Langer lines, and the Langer lines have to do um, with your uh, planes of fascia and how everything uh, works together, and something that your surgeons pay attention to because if they follow the Langer lines, that's how you get really nice. Uh, surgical incisions and closures without a lot of scarring. There, there's a little bit of my med school background since I did a lot of surgery. That's where those are important. Anyway, uh, going into the microscopy. So, unfortunately, a lot of what you see under the scope is non-specific. And again, you need to be buddies with your clinicians because if they aren't telling you what you need to know, that the patch looks like this. This is what happened with. Uh, this kid before they came in or this young adult um, a lot of what we see under the scope isn't necessarily going to help you one thing that will help you though is that parakeratosis which often forms those mounds of parakeratosis so that's what I was uh, kind of referring to is you have these areas where there's not going to be a lot of it then it's going to mound up and your granular layer is frequently diminished okay so not completely absent but it basically it's not there um, 
your so when they say that the mounds of pericardiosis have this angulated appearance, so what that means is at the edges where it's thinning out, it kind of gives it more of a triangular appearance. And what you can see in the top picture is that separation and elevation from the epidermis where it has that cleft, that artificial cleft, um, with preserved attachment on the one side. So it looks like it's lifting up on one area and it's attached on the other side. Your dermis is going to have very mild perivascular lymphocytes. Note, we're not saying EOs on this one, so that's great. And you will see some RBC extravasation. Uh, you can see uh, acanthosis, but you don't have to. And you might have some dyskeratotic keratinocytes in about half your cases. So, not a lot to go off of, but you kind of put it all together along with the clinical history, and that's how you'll get there. Your differential, again, is going to look a little different from what we've seen. Your gutate psoriasis, uh, tinea corporis, those are probably your most common things, your thema annulare um, treatment. So again, it's self-limited, so they don't require anything, but if they're really itchy, you could uh, do some corticosteroids. And again, benign self-limited disease. Pterysis rosacea. Or Rosea. 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 PR. I'm just, I'm gonna like give everything an acronym. If anyone watches Frasier, that's a condition he had when he was a kid. Frasier Crane. Yes. <laughs> Something from the know. 90s. <laughs> yeah, a very popular sitcom from the 90s starring Kelsey Grammer. Um, it's, if you like a good laugh about a psychiatrist, it's worth a look. Okay, but we're <laughs> moving on to case six. Ooh, okay. Um, yeah, definitely some sort of erythematous lesion um, mm -hmm. on, on the finger, like finger, this, the phalanges basically. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So you see how it comes along the fingers, it's on his knees, yeah. it's on his abdomen. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's true. He has a belly button. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So here's your slide. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, huh. Far away. Looks like definitely some acanthosis going on. Kind of like the dermal papillae are kind of like extended. Mm -hmm. Kind of like deep in. And then looking closer, there seems to be some sort of edema type of, like kind of, it looks a little loose. Right. Yeah. Okay. And I think it contains, I don't know. What's so. in there? Neutrophils? Mm -hmm. Kind of like little ants. Um, mm, there just seems to be, I mean, the granular layer, I think it's there. Really? Not, well, not really. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell. I mean, it might be there, but it's really thin. Um, there's this does seem to be What's all that stuff? Well, it's keratin. I'm just trying to figure out if I should call this Parakeratosis or keratosis. I think it's parakeratosis. There's does seems to be nuclei in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So parakeratosis um, hmm. And then let's see now um, A lot of inflammation, you know They're mostly, I don't know, maybe a mix of like neutrophils and lymphocytes. There does seem to be more neutrophils more in the superficial area. The yep. spondylosis are wonderful finding. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, well, you got most of the features. There's kind of just one other thing that's pretty prominent on this case. If you start noticing all your spaces, the yeah, the vessels. So what's going on with those? They're like dilated. They're dilated. I barely see anything. Vessels. Okay. Okay. <laughs> like this one's probably really good because you can see here's yeah. a vessel here, here's one up here. Yeah. So very dilated. What happened to all the 
red cells? Did yeah. Washed away, or did they come out? <laughs> so what do we got? Psoriasis. Psoriasis. Okay, so this is also known as psoriasis vulgaris or psoriasis common. <laughs> um, however, even though it says psoriasis common, it only affects one to three percent of the population. So, grain of salt with that. It tends to occur in uh, younger adults, so 25 to 35 years old, no sex um, predominance. However, when it occurs in children, there's a definite female predominance. Uh, these are very itchy lesions. And there's a whole bunch of complex immunology, which we are definitely not going to get into. But yeah, immunology, lots of cytokines. Cytokines make you itchy. Okay, um, so this tends to occur on your dorsal surfaces of the extremities as well as the scalp, the trunk, nails, buttocks. And what we saw in our case was there was also some focal involvement of the trunk. These are very well demarcated erythematous plaques and patches, and they tend to have this silvery scale. I don't think that was super obvious in the clinical picture that we had, but they were very erythematous and, and very well defined. Um, so the Ospitz sign is if you remove the scale over top of these lesions, you'll have pinpoint bleeding. Um, so clinicians will sometimes do that. And you can also sometimes see the Warren offering, which is this uh, white ring that goes around the erythematous plaques. Um, but this occurs in patients who are undergoing phototherapy. So if this is a brand new diagnosis and the patient hasn't been treated at all, you're not going to see that. So you have different things happening in your epidermis and dermis. So in the epidermis, you're going to have what's called confluent paraparatosis. So instead of the mounding that we saw in pityriasis, this is going to be confluent, so it's going to go all the way across the lesion. Um, you're also going to have um, psoriasiform hyperplasia, as well as thinning over the derm dermal papillae. So you kind of have this uh, contradiction where you have uh, the uh, ridges are going to extend down and there's going to be definite thickening and that's where we saw those great big dips of blue on our slide. But then the thinning occurs over top of the papillae. So where we were seeing those more edematous areas, the um, epidermis is thinned over top of that. You will also see neutrophils present in the epidermis. They may be uh, in microapsises. So again, those are those Monroe microapsises. Uh, and you can also see them within the spinous layers as well. And when they do that, they're uh, termed the spongiform pustules of Kajaj. And someone is going to tell me that I said that wrong. I'm calling it now. Okay, within the dermis, so you have your dilated vessels within the papillary dermis. You can see red cell extravasation. There was some focal extravasation in that case, but not really prominent. And you're going to have this very dense perivascular, lymphocytic, uh, Langerhans cells, as well as neutrophils. So those are all things to pay attention to with, with psoriasis. Now, psoriasis has about a million different forms. And they're all a little different. Um, the molecular for psoriasis is very complex um, and polygenic mutations are more common in monozygotic twins than dizygotic twins. That kind of makes sense because again your dizygotic twins are no different than uh, regular siblings for sharing DNA. So uh, there's a definite link but we just don't quite know exactly what it is yet. Uh, your differential, again, we're going to look at things like, is this lichen simplex chronicus? Is this pityriasis? Is it just a psoriasiform keratosis? Uh, as well as chronic eczematous dermatitis. So all these things that we've been looking at where you can have these acanthotic layers, they're very pyritic, they're very erythematous, they may be scaly or not. Um, all these things kind of get mashed into the same differential. Uh, so again, they can do topical therapy for this, the phototherapy, so that's where you're seeing um, those worn off rings, those white rings, if the patients have initiated phototherapy, which can help. Um, they can do systemic therapies like methotrexates or, or retinoids, 
And there's also biologics that they can use. So these are um, all your uh, immunomodulators like infliximab and something something MAB and a tenercept. And basically it's just trying to find out what works for the patient, what doesn't give them too many side effects. Um, because this is a chronic disease. So they're gonna have periods where they're okay and then they're gonna relapse. Um, and because there's this remitting, uh, relapsing, that goes back and forth, back and forth, they actually can develop seronegative polyarthritis. Psoriasis. Okay, vesicle bullous dermatoses, AKA things that look and sound very similar but have slight differences. So this is K7, whenever it loads. Some sort of eruption of red, looks painful, very inflamed. Okay. Things. Okay. Yeah. Here's your slide. Okay. Skin. Skin, yes. <laughs> Yeah, ooh. That's not something you see every day. It yeah. seems to be separation of the um, epidermis from the dermis. Just a little. Um, let's see, the granular is intact. They're intact. Um, maybe some mild spongiosis. area, but mm -hmm. there's stuff in it. Are those neutrophils in debris? It looks kind of like pus. Like five, yeah. There's definitely a lot of neutrophils okay. in there. Like yeah. it's a yeah. microabscess yes. sort of type thing. Ooh, that's exciting. <laughs> I mean, other than that, it looks you know, pretty uneventful for the most part. But those micro, like this piece looks not so bad. There's again some inflammation, some chronic inflammation around the very vascular inflammation, but that's nothing new. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't think, I think the other piece is more exciting. The Can other piece is more exciting. Yeah, okay, let's go back. Let's go back. Um, yeah, like even here, I think there's some abscess interior here. Good, that's yes, it. there is. Yeah, I think that's the key finding. Um, well, as well as the stuff Right, this isn't something that normally yeah. occurs. Okay, so this is separate from the abscess because yeah. this abscess looks like it's separating as well. And the abscess is forming in the separation left. So, yeah. Okay. So I have both things going on. Right. Okay, so what do we have? Um, I don't know, some sort of microabscess. Do you have a clinical hint? Uh, <laughs> not really. Not really. All these things are bullous. All of them. So they all have blisters. Blisters. Okay. <laughs> Refer to I don't know. Consult. Derm. Consult. Derm. <laughs> stat. Help us. Okay. So this is uh, dermatitis repetiformis. Yeah. Um, so these are actually autoantibodies that um, occur, their autoantibodies, sorry, to epidermal transglutaminase, so very specific autoantibodies. Um, and you can also see some other autoantibodies as well. Um, but that's the most common, most specific. And these uh, result in subepidermal blistering or bulla that are also very, very itchy. Um, these are very, like, well-known high association with gluten sensitive enteropathies, autoimmune thyroid disease, as well as lymphomas involving the bowel. Okay, so usually this is symmetrical involvement of either the elbows, knees, nape of the neck, uh, scalp, sacrum, and they don't often show vesicles grossly, even though this is a, a, obviously a bullous lesion. 
And part of the reason for that is that they're so itchy that these patients are going to scratch them and unroof them. Um, so when we have very early lesions, then that's when you're going to see those uh, dermal microabscesses. That, again, are going to predominantly be neutrophils, and obviously we had a lot of them in that one piece of the case. And when they uh, are later lesions, then what you're going to see is that split with neutrophils in the base, and um, often you'll have microabscesses around that. So I think we had some of that in our case as well. Um, all other features are nonspecific, so as was pointed out, even though we had superficial perivascular lymphocytes, we've seen that before, so it doesn't really help you too much with this. What does help, though, is your immunofluorescence, so this is going to be a very common theme with these cases. So if you do direct IF, they have a very granular IgA, and they may or may not have C3 or IgM in the dermal papillae. So that's what we're showing on the top right. That is your IgA. You also, rare IF patterns, you can see IgA at uh, the dermal epidermal junction. Sorry, that's what DEJ stands for, is dermal epidermal junction. And you can also see this very fibrillary IgA in the dermal papillae. But the thing to really know is the granular IgA in the papillae, and that's what we're showing. Your differential is pretty much going to be all your other uh, pemphigoid and bullous type lesions. So again, that should be a hint of what else you're going to see in this lecture. Treatment, this is associated with gluten sensitivity, so don't eat gluten if you have this. And they can also give them dapsone. But remember, there's a lot of things that go wrong when you're taking dapsone, so not everyone wants to do that. And um, Prognosis otherwise is excellent in these cases. So the bond picture is just showing you one of those clefts that you can see. So I think in, in our case, there were some clefts that were starting and they were surrounded by microapsises. Um, but that's der dermatitis herpetiformis. Case eight. Ooh, bigger with bubblies. Yes, bigger bubblies. It's more painful. It does look more painful, doesn't it? Yeah. Boobles. Boobles. Boob. Okay, so three, uh, two pieces. Yeah. Um, it's an old slide. It looks very red. <laughs> That's just from old slides, but look at that. Look at that nice cleft. And it's between, I think it's between the epidermal layer and the dermis, right? It's not intraderm, not epidermal. So, yeah, look at that. And then there's some <laughs> sort of like, I know these cases, one of them is like something about tombstoning. Um, we need to look out for. I don't know. Okay. Uh, Dr. Siegel has a term she called like tombstone or something, and I can't remember which lesion it goes with. Okay. Well, That's we're not case. seeing that here. No. I can tell you now. No. Okay. Um. <laughs> but. <laughs> what do you see in there, though? I see a lot of eels. Yeah, it's all eels. Eels, eels, eels. eels. Sounds like I'm just talking about the. Aquatic creature rather than the actual. <laughs> um, yeah, and maybe no. I think they're eels, not even not even like neutrophils. Maybe it'd be hard to tell. There's a couple neutrophils, yeah. but okay. it's almost all eosinophils. Yeah. Okay. Bolus pemphigoid. I think it was between the dermis and the epidermis. Okay. I will accept that as your final answer, but you need to find all the other features. All right. Spongiosis. Spongiosis. Okay. Um, well, that's the other thing we should kind of see with it. It has to do with the dermis. Good, I like that. Keep going with that. Remember, this is derm. And 99, well, essentially 99% of derm path cases involve what? Inflammation? There's not that much inflammation. There's some 
where is your information? <laughs> Superficially. Okay, superficial, I'll accept that. Perivascular, maybe. Perivascular, good. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll stop torturing you. You can also <laughs> see uh, like some, uh, some interstitial. Interstitial. Oh. Yeah. Oh, you mean like? Yeah, we're just kind of flitting through yeah. the lesion. Is it like the red thing something? I think it should be concerned. Are you processing? No. Yeah, no, that's okay. Just, it's an old slide. <laughs> it's the color. It's a red gold. herring. <laughs> and it's literally, it's literally red. red. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, um, it's just old slides, yeah. Yeah. So yes, this is bull's pemphigoid. Oh dear. It tends to occur in elderly patients and males more than females. And these are autoantibodies to BPAG one and two on the hemidesmosomes at the dorsal at uh, sorry, at the dermal epidermal junction. Um, so there's a, a lot of things that you can look at. Is it uh, drug induced? So um, think about elderly patients, they tend to be on a lot of different medications, including diuretics, captopril's, uh, penicillamine, uh, moxicillin has been implicated, uh, gold, maybe not seen so much, but um, I did see a, a video post the other day on Twitter about uh, this, these gold dusted uh, chicken wings and it literally I think just gave me heartburn looking at it um, and also anti-tumor uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha so a, lo a lot of different things that can cause um, drug induced pemphigoid these lesions are extremely pyritic right all those eosinophils you know it's going to be itchy and there's also very rare associations with underlying malignancy. So when it says age appropriate screening should be completed, if not to date, and it occurs in people over 60, that means they should have a C scope or a colonos colonoscopy. Um, if they haven't had one, they should have a mammogram if they aren't up to date with those. If they're not too old and uh, female, then you'd also want to think about cervical screening, um, all those kind of wonderful things that should be done if they haven't been done already. These are generalized bulla, but they're very common to see on the lower abdomen, the forearms, the thighs, and rarely you can see mucosal involvement, although 10 to 30 percent, I don't know how rare that is. These are very tense bulla, and they range in size from one to four centimeters. So you, in, having a, a two inch lesion that's incredibly itchy, I, I don't know how well I would do personally. Um, and these, the early lesions can, pe can appear urticarial, so they can appear very erythematous before they start to form that blister. Okay, we pretty much saw all this. So you have subepidermal clefting, or bulla, um, with very abundant eosinophils, very rare to have neutrophil predominant, they do occur. However, um, if you have neutrophil predominant, again, go back, think, is this the correct thing? Uh, eosinophilic spongiosis can occur. Your superficial and interstitial perivascular lymphocytic eosinophilic and neutrophilic infiltrates can occur. There are urticarial bullous pemphigoid as well as cell poor bullous pemphigoid. So again, always lots of different variants of things. Going straight to your immunofluorescence. So your direct IF is gonna have these very linear deposits at the, at the dermal epidermal junction of IgG. And you may see um, IgG and C3 or complement three, or it could be either one of them. Uh, what I'm showing there is IgG. If you do ELISA or indirect, again, it's going to be serum IgG, and sometimes you can see IgA. What's nice about this is that the level of uh, the serum level correlates with disease severity. So as they're being treated, that's something that clinicians can use to uh, correspond with how the patient's actually responding to the treatment. So there is some HLA to know with this. For Caucasian patients, uh, HLA DQB1-0301, 
And the uh, Japanese patients actually have a few different HLA parameters that are, are commonly associated with Bull's pemphigoid. Um, the most common one, it, though, is the HLA DRB104. Your differential, so EBA, uh, linear, linear IgA bolus dermatosis, bolus lupus, pemphigus vulgaris, and uh, cicatrical <laughs> pemphigoid. Yeah, uh, a lot of terms that I really need phonetics with them. Um, so again, our systemics, we're going to our steroids, uh, we're going to our uh, systemic therapies such as like uh, methotrexate, they can do cyclosporin, uh, mycophenolate, mofetil, or Celsept is, is pretty common, um, nicotinamide, rituximab, so you can see how we're starting to get into a lot more of like the chemotherapy treatments with these. Um, they can do topical treatments, and they can also do things like high dose um, IVIG or plasmapheresis. And again, this is a chronic condition, so there are going to be remissions and relapses are very common. Case nine. More bubbly, so we're not as crazy. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, that's kind of it. Okay, more skin. More uh, skin. I mean, it looks very similar to the previous one. You have these like clefts mm -hmm. in there. Uh, it does seem to be a lot more inflamed, I would say. A lot more inflammatory cells, um, EOs, and lymphocytes, probably. Um, separating along the epidermal dermis junction, dermal junction. Um, I think the inflation looks mostly like more or less superficial, perivascular, although okay. it's kind of hard to tell. There are a lot of gl more glands in this specimen, but I don't think. Maybe there's a few stray inflammatory cells here and there, but I don't think it's too prominent. Mostly here. Mm -hmm. uh, take a look at the other piece. I mean, this piece looks a lot better than the other one. There's not much inflammation going on here at all. There's maybe a mild inflammatory infiltrate. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And this one's not even like lifting up, like, you know, I think the leash is on the other side or the other section. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, all in all, it kind of looks like the other one, except with more inflammation. Okay. So where's your blister? Your blister is sub-epidermal. Okay. And what's in your blister? Uh, some inflammatory cells, lymphocytes. Okay. Not really seeing any eels. They're kind of stuck down here. There's, there's stuff down there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so they're kind of where we would expect them to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So what do you have? Uh, the EB, EBA? Something EBA? EBA? EBA. Are you asking or telling me? Well, I'm asking and telling at the same time. <laughs> it's kind of like telling and then with a little asking at the end. So. Okay, okay. All right, so this is EBA or epidermal lysis bullosa acquisita. EBA is easier to say. Um, so this occurs in adults. Lots of different things can cause it, namely hepatitis C infections. Lots of autoimmune uh, conditions can cause this, as well as malignancy. So things like multiple myeloma, GYM malignancies, GI malignancies. Um, grossly, this occurs on acrocytes, but it can also be generalized. And these are um, mechanoboli, so they occur with rubbing. You can have milia, and you can also have atrophic scarring related to the bullae as well. On microscopy, you have subepidermal clefts and bullae that are posicellular. So that's kind of where I was trying to get you to go. Like there, there's some inflammatory cells there, but not a lot, and definitely nowhere near as much as we have with BP. Um, and then your infiltrate that's in your, your dermis is, is a mixed infiltrate. Um, I still think in our case it was predominantly lymphocytes, but you have a little bit of everything going on there. Immunofluorescence. Uh, so this one, 
uh, has linear deposits of IgG at the basement membrane zone, um, but you can sometimes see other things like C3, IgA, or IgM. Um, and you really have to do the immunofluorescent in the, the perilesional skin to really see this. Um, for molecular, again, we have more HLA, so uh, both Caucasian and African patients tend to have this HLA DRB1-1501. And Korean patients have an HLA DRB113. Your differential, not too shockingly, is pretty much exactly the same as BP. Uh, your treatments, again, corticosteroids, your uh, same chemotherapy type agents such as methotrexate, um, colchicine can make an appearance. We have dapsone comes back in again. And these patients can also be treated with gold therapy, but re remember, you want to think about all the side effects that come with using um, uh, metals for therapy as well. Um, they can also use high dose IVIG, they can use photochemotherapy, and minocycline can also be used. So the prognosis for these cases, if the patient has an underlying malignancy, so say they have multiple myeloma, or they have uh, some GYN um, carcinoma, then these lesions will respond to therapy. If they don't, if this is just straight EBA, um, they're often refractory to therapy. So unfortunately, these patients are just stuck with it, and then you're um, trying to find something to provide them some relief. Okay, and yeah. case 10. Okay, we have more lysis. No we changes. do, we do, okay. yes. But, um, uh, ooh, is this the tombstone? What is this? This is the tombstone. Oh, oh, yeah, this is, see, I know there was, it was one of the cases. So, <laughs> this is the, since we went for the Pentagoy, so this must be Pentagis, because I'm applied the process of elimination, but we're not going to stop <laughs> there. Um, so, yeah, it definitely looked like it's intraderm epidermal this time, because you kind of see epidermis, epidermis, blah. So you understand where you have those tombstones, right? Because yes, the it's splitting. Little, yes. Yes. It's kind of tearing apart. Tombstones. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. And then there's, you know, some inflammation underneath. Mostly lymphocytic. Yeah. 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 And um, yeah, I mean, even then, you know, you get also get the infiltration like the uh, previous one, but the lysis part is in the epidermis. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to remember with this case. There's something else you can see in the epidermis. Uh, I don't. What the heck is yeah, that? no, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just. <laughs> hmm. It's like, yeah, okay, I'm seeing like a couple of them. Couple. You seen of those? Yeah, you seen. <laughs> yeah. There, see, you know how this goes. Uh, mm -hmm. So for derm, we're always hunting for eosinophils, yeah. <laughs> um, or at least with these kind of lesions. All right. Okay. So I'm not going to torture you too much because other things you can see um, really isn't so much visible here. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so what does this see? Spolus pemphigus. Pemphigus. Pemphigus vulgaris. Vulgar both. Yeah. Pemphigus vulgaris, oh, yeah, I know. Bolus pemphigus, pemphigus vulgaris, pemphigoid. <laughs> that is why all these things it's made the it real into. Thing. It's the real thing, not the goy. This is why the handout has <laughs> yeah. da 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 because they sound alike, they have very similar features, mm -hmm. and they're confusing. But it's the real thing, it's them. not a void, it's an us. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay, so we're looking at middle-aged adults, 46 years old, no sex predilection. Yes, finally, something else we don't have to remember. They are more common in, in uh, patients of Jewish ancestry. And pemphigus vulgaris is the most common form. And why? Well, vulgaris, vulgar means common. Um, yeah, so for anyone who didn't know that, vulgar actually means common. It doesn't mean disgusting or anything like that. It means common. Well, the vulgar was the common people, so to <laughs> yes. be vulgar, you're so common, you know? Yes. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that's all you're getting for English history lesson, lesson but um, it actually relates to autoantibodies to Desmoglene 3, and 
Those words should probably haunt you from Med 1 all the way through. Uh, Desmoglene 3 autoantibodies. Um, so these have both cutaneous and mucosal erosions with very flaccid bullets. So these are, and they are painful. So that is something that we have not seen this entire time, uh, except for one of our earlier lesions. But for the most part, we saw these are itchy lesions. These lesions are painful. Kind of makes sense. They're massive blisters. They're going to rip open. To me, that sounds like it hurts. Okay. A lot of etiology is associated with this. It says C table and handouts. So if you are looking at these slides, make sure you go and check out the attachment that is uh, on Path Presenter um, so that you get the handout that has all the extra stuff in there and everything that we've been looking at all in nice neat little tables to make it easier to go over. Uh, grossly, so the, these are generalized uh, bullet, again they're flaccid, they may or may not have crested plaques or erosions off top, over top of them. And the Nikolsky sign, um, so if you uh, take your finger and rub the skin on these patients where they don't have a blister, you're going to form a new one. That's what Nikolsky sign is. And Abso Hansen sign is when you have um, you have a blister that's intact. So these patients probably won't be too happy with you, but you have it, they have an intact blister, and if you put some slight pressure on top of that, it's going to extend the blister laterally rather than just like. Um, like with uh, bolus pemphigoid where those are very firm intact blisters and it would just kind of cushion down if you put pressure on those as well. And the bottom point kind of tells you why you maybe shouldn't try the Abso Hansen sign. Intact blisters are rare. Okay, um, so the clinical picture that I have up there so you can see how this is really extensive on the patient's uh, back and the bottom picture is showing you that tombstoning as well as the clefting. All right, so these are intradermal vesicles or blisters with superbacillar acantholysis. So what does that mean? That means that the basal layer of your keratinocytes are gonna remain intact, they're gonna be on the basement membrane, and you're gonna have a splitting of the epidermal layer above that. The blisters themselves tend to be round, um, but they can have acantholytic keratinocytes, again, because you're having that separation. So the tombstone appearance relates to those intact basal keratinocytes that are attached to the basement membrane. So they're attached to the basement membrane, they're attached, uh, um, yeah, sorry, to the basement membrane, <laughs> but everything on top of that has been lifted off. It's been unroofed from, from the basement uh, from the, that, that bacillar layer. Um, so that's where you really get that tombstone appearance. You're not really going to appreciate it on the superficial epidermal layer. It's just at the basal layer. You can have eosinophilic spongiosis. And what does that mean? You're going to have eos within the epidermis. So that's kind of what we were hunting for. It wasn't super prominent, but there were a few of them that were scattered. You can have acantholysis uh, involving hair follicles, your dermal perivascular. Uh, infiltrate tends to be mononuclear, but you can have eosinophils as well. Again, the eos are kind of everywhere on this. Um, uncommonly would be having apoptotic keratinocytes. So even though they're separated, even though you have this flaccid uh, blister, um, you're not going to really see uh, apoptosis within your keratinocytes. So going back to our immunofluorescence, since this is our friend with all these blistering lesions, Again, at the perilesional skin, you're going to have a chicken wire pattern of IgG and slash or C3. So chicken wire, that's something that we like to liken to a lot of things, particularly in our bone soft tissue lesions. This refers specifically to your immunofluorescence for direct IF. Your indirect IF or ELISA, you're going to have uh, IgG levels that are specific to desmoglene 3, and I put in there the caveat of desmoglene 1 and other subtypes of Pemphigus vulgaris. Um, but desmoglene 3 is the most common, so if you have to pick one to know, know that one. Um, and again, these levels correlate with disease activity. Your differential, again, some slightly different things. So whether we're looking at derriere syndrome, acantholytic acanthoma, 
warty dyskeratomas, bolus and pedigo, benign familial pemphigus or uh, haley haley disease, um, and Grover disease as well. Your treatment, well, we don't really see a lot of things that are different from what we've been seeing everywhere else. Uh, what is different is that they can do topical antimicrobials. So, uh, and that makes sense because we have all these very easily unroofed blisters and so you have these open areas that would be prone to infections. So topical antibiotics is actually a very good idea. These patients can also be treated with high dose IVIG, uh, therapeutic plasma exchange, or uh, plasma paresis, as well as uh, phototherapy. The prognosis is good for these patients if their therapy is started early. Um, and historically, so not really so much anymore, but historically, these patients had a very high mortality, and again, that was due to infection. You uh, would liken a lot of what they would get to be similar to um, thinking about like burn victims, uh, because they, they don't have that intact protective layer. So that is your pemphigus vulgaris. So what this slide is showing you is the comparison between all the lesions that we were looking at and uh, where you should see your uh, direct IF. Okay, so this is direct IF. This is not ELISA, which is indirect. Um, so whether you're looking at the roof, the floor, is it granular, is it linear? Uh, and again, that chicken wire C3 on Pemphigus vulgaris. And with that, that's all we have for this week. So I left you with 18 cases that are challenge cases. Um, again, just try your best with these. A lot of these things are very similar uh, and they are difficult. Uh, no one ever says any of these things are, are easy, um, but do take a look. If you like this video, please hit like. Uh, if you are involved on social media, please share our videos. And if you aren't subscribed, you can click that little button that's showing up on our video now. And uh, we will see you next week on another slide review.